Hello, young musicians of the Florida Youth Symphony Orchestras. Here is a video to review what we discussed during our practice wall session. I hope you find it helpful. Let's start with the first violin part with Glenka. This passage is really exciting and I love it. But I also know that there's a problem because it's so easy to rush and unless we really drill it, our rhythm can get quite murky. So it's really, really important to practice this passage with a metronome. And what else? I would also subdivide the long notes in my head. some of the other things that I would do in this excerpt. I need to plan my bow usage and distribution. We're somehow always expecting that we're going to land on the down bow on the beat. But in this particular excerpt, in the bowings that I see marked in the part you provided, it actually won't turn out that way to play every beat on a down bow. I would therefore practice these passages with a special attention, deliberately telling myself that the beat comes on an up bow. This is to prevent confusion when we are actually stressed out. Under stress, unless otherwise so drilled, the hands often want to go back to what feels more normal and usual. So we have to really teach our hand that the beat falls on the up bow in this excerpt. Bow distribution. I need to figure out where I want to be at the start of the stroke. So my question is always, how do I get there? For example, There are lots of bow distribution and planning that have to happen in this excerpt. Another stroke that is important in this excerpt are the ace notes with the dots. This stroke is not exactly light and fluffy and completely off the string. It is only slightly off the string, sort of like in between hardcore spiccato and being completely on the string. What else besides the details of bow planning do we need to do here? We need to figure out the shaping of the phrase. Let's take this passage and figure it out. Even though this is all eighth notes, there's still musical shapes here. Sequence one, for example, starts at eight before A, and the second sequence starts at four before A. And within each of the sequences, it starts low and goes up to the high D.
Furthermore, in this particular passage, I want left hand clarity. How do I achieve this? So first, I would begin by slurring bar by bar instead of playing everything separate. This allows me to isolate my left hand and to really focus on gaining clarity. I would also practice with different rhythmic patterns. You might think that there's a lot to do for a not so long a passage, but practicing takes a lot of details. We now move on to the viola. We'll be looking at the second symphony of Hansen. Since I don't play the viola, I asked my friend Mei Ching to play it for me. But first, let's pay attention to the bow placement in bar four of the first line. At the end of the third bar, my guess is that you will likely be at the tip. But because of the accent you have in the next bar after the triplet, it would be better to get to the lower part of the bow. It's also the same problem in the next bar. Another thing we want to look at is how to play the septuplet. It comes with the crescendo to the fortissimo. And we have to make sure every note can be heard. To achieve this crescendo, we need to use the bow speed and change it. This particular run goes over, however, two strings, the G and the D. So let's practice first with the open strings on the open G and D and with the bow changing speed to increase the volume, as in this crescendo. Let's also look at the second and the third bars. Both down bows and up bows have an accent. It's important in this case that accents on both the down and the up are even. Usually, we know that it's very easy to accent on the down bow, but the up bow is a little bit weaker. In order to avoid this unbalanced problem, there needs to be a catch at the very beginning of each stroke but after that, we need to retain a degree of pressure so the sound does not completely disappear. Again, let's first practice with an open string. And it's really important that the down and the up bows are even. We can now add back the left hand, first without the vibrato, and then with the vibrato.
To summarize, let's listen to Machen playing the entire excerpt. <laughs> Next, we have the cello excerpt as well as the bass excerpt, and they're going to be introduced to you by Mike and Will. Hello, my name is Michael Kaufman. I'm a cellist in the Los Angeles Opera Orchestra and the Cello Quintet Sakura. Today we're looking at Glinka's Ruslan and Ludmilla Overture. This excerpt is known for being exciting and bombastic, and it's very fast. It's important that you convey all the expression that you possibly can. When you're playing this excerpt, it's really important to keep your bow in the lower half. If you get too far out, it becomes very, very difficult to play. The first challenge that we come across is the half note in the first bar, followed by two quarter notes. Now, if we get too far out in the bow, we'll find ourselves in a difficult situation. It's kind of messy getting back to the frog, so it's important to really save bow. But how do you save bow and still have a really bombastic, exciting sound? I propose a kind of gear system to the arm. Let's say if I were to play a note in a normal way, my elbow and my hand move out basically at the same speed. So my elbow has swung out about half of the way to the tip. And this perhaps is where it would be when I get to the tip. Now if I employ this type of cello playing in this excerpt, I'll use way too much bow. So I would encourage you to think about thinking about your elbow and your wrist as sort of a gear system. Maybe you could think of having a larger circle in your elbow followed by a smaller circle in the wrist. So for instance, uh, you could allow your elbow to travel that same distance, but not move nearly as far in the bow. And actually in this excerpt, we don't even want to go that far. When practicing this excerpt, I would recommend actually starting completely smooth, maybe play it through slurred once, then play it legato. This way, it's much easier to actually hear the musical line form throughout the phrase. It's also easier to coordinate the two hands. And frequently I find that when people try to play fast music, the left hand can get quite tight. The bow also gets very tight. So if you can really focus on freeing up your bow arm, a lot of times that can help the left hand move much more fluently. For instance, I might approach the beginning of the second line like this. Hello, my name is Will Cravey. I'm a bass player in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and today Midori has asked for me to share with you some tips for how to approach the fourth movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. The excerpt today is the at the end of the exposition, transferring for the second time into the development. The first thing that we need to discuss is the sense of drama, or the sense of character of the piece. And for me, this is really a special moment, because the first time around, when we go back to the beginning, we have this fiery F minor to this very stern G that becomes G dominant. It relaxes into 
receive. But this time, things work a little differently. We again have the stern F minor. We have the very strong G major. And then, like a bolt of lightning, we have this E dominant chord. It's very, very just magical. And then a resolution on A major. One of the most important things we can do is to make lines out of the music so that things aren't just even and steady, but that they go somewhere and come back from somewhere. So it's often necessary to really drive towards goals. Um, the same thing here when we have a surprise. Really something that comes out of the texture to show it that it's not just jug, 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 jug the whole time. When something is more stern, it's probably more accented, but also dominant has tension. But when we get to we want to dissipate that tension. So not something that's sluggish or that stops, but something that's lifted and, and really light and elegant. So how do we address the difficulties in this passage? The piece is fairly quick, it's loud, it's low, and has lots of arpeggios, so lots of moving up and down the instrument. Well, the first thing that I would address is for loud and low, we can't use something small or even something kind of large. We need to make use of the whole body. So for the course of this entire video, I want you to picture a fermata and imagine that pretty much everything we do today is going around that fermata. So the first place that we can use the fermata is the spine, this way, going around the spine, really using our back to start to pull sound. So instead of having something that looks like which is okay, I want really pulling with the back, trying to get sound out. And in addition to the back, we can use the lats. Once again, we have the fermata circle, and then we flip it upside down, and we move around and a little smiley with our, with our shoulders. So we can engage our lats and our obliques as well. we will shrink all of this. But if this sort of dance isn't happening with you and you're just pushing straight down on your arm, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> the next use of the fermata for me is the left hand. We don't just push all of it down. We have the circle in the middle and we turn in a frown around the circle. So for me, I do something in between an extension and a shift for a lot of these things. I, just like pouring a pancake, the batter hits the pan and then separates. I want to try to get my first finger and fourth finger as far away from each other as possible in a natural, relaxed way. I tend to call it the pancake, where it hits and pancakes. And then from there, I want to rock between the two. In the same way that you can rock between your sit bones when you're sitting, or if you're standing, you can lean on one foot and then the other. I'm never pressing both down at the same time, but I can't play some of these notes that really need to be well down <laughs> without uh, the sense of rocking. But it's not down, it's around and around, moving around a center point. One of the other issues for the double bass is how much or how little it rings in different registers. So for me, depending on the bass, depending on the style, depending on how the orchestra is playing, we really have to be attentive of this. Um, at the end, 
we have to dampen the A string and not let it ring. In the opening, some orchestras will really have defined spaces between the notes. Other orchestras, where the hall is, is perhaps a little bit more dry, will have wall-to-wall -wall sustain. Uh, I suggest practicing three different techniques for figuring out what to do in any given circumstance. First, I always, always, always suggest playing things through pizzicato so you can hear absolutely perfectly if the left hand is really down and sustaining. Um, the second trick that I would use is really picked up at the ends, clear silences between the notes, because sometimes we need that. And the last trick would be to play a little bit further out in the bow and totally legato. Making sure that we can control these things can give us the freedom to make the contrasts and the type of sounds that we want to make.